Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our service today. We've come to worship. You'll notice if you are here in this room that there are May baskets that are prepared for you by the, some of the ladies from the church, so please enjoy those. For those that are joining us on Facebook Live, welcome to our service today. And for those who will be watching on YouTube later in the week, welcome to our service. So I'm very excited that we can come and worship together today. The worship team has songs prepared for us. I'm going to ask us to stand. Let's worship together this morning. Set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil while we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very soul. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. We are your church, and we need your power in us. We seek your kingdom first. We hunger and we thirst. We refuse to waste our lives for your joy and pride. To see the captive hearts release the hurt. Sick the poor repeats. We lay down our lives for heaven's cause. We are your church. We pray, revive this earth. Build your kingdom. hope on earth. We are to be salt and light. I love the verse that asks the question, if, if, we lo if salt loses its saltiness, what good is it? If we don't stand out, if we don't bring out the love and the grace and the goodness of God in this world, then how is anybody going to see it? How is anybody going to know him? How is anybody going to come to him if we're not different, if we don't stand out? So be salt and light, my friends.
Love could remember no wrong we have done. Omniscient, all knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. Thank you, worship team. We are going to dismiss our children off to their groups at this time. And we do have a new baby in the church. Brindley Rose Bartlett was born on Friday. 
So that is great. We are going to take a moment to recognize any college or university senior that's graduating. Do we have any that are here in this room? So I know we have Josh. So Josh, could you stand up? Do we have any others? No, college, college and university, Zeb Nims is in there. So, oh, Ellen, you're graduating as well. Okay. So, uh, yes. So, so, Ellen, can you tell us what your future plans are? New Jersey, okay. Josh, what is your future plans? Okay, and Zeb, what is your future plans? What seminary are you going to? In Bangor, yes. So, very good. All right, thank you very much. Let's take a moment to pray for these students. Lord, we thank you for Ellen and for Josh and for Zeb. Lord, we also thank you for Maddie and Josh Chen as they will be graduating as well. Lord, we just ask your blessing upon each of these young people. Lord, we thank you for the time that they have been here as part of our church. And some will be moving, some will be staying nearby. So Lord, just we just ask your blessing upon whatever they do. We just are so grateful for these um, young men and women. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so I'd like to begin this morning where we left off last week as far as our sermon. And let's put on the screen kind of our major thought last week, and it'll be the same this week. And if we can put that on the screen, st screen let's strive, let's, let's read it together. Let's strive to live in the fullness of grace and truth. Okay, let's read that again. This is so very important. Let's strive to live in the fullness of grace and truth. Now, last week when I was sharing this with you, and especially at the very end of the sermon time, when I was sharing about the story of the men's study group, you came alive. As I looked out upon the crowd, you, there was more and more kind of smiles, and really what we were experiencing was joy. To, to think about this experience as I was sharing it. And so as I was thinking about this this past week, why did joy fill this place? And so I have tried to summarize in, in this paragraph. Because you heard words of love and acceptance and healing based in the reality of brokenness. You heard words of hope and growth and joy that is produced in our lives as we live in the fullness of grace and truth found only in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let me read that again because this is so very important. You heard words of love and acceptance, healing based in the reality of our brokenness. You heard words of hope and growth and joy that is produced in our lives as we live in the fullness of grace and truth found only in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I've been thinking and pondering for the last number of weeks, Matthew chapter 11, and that's where my Bible is open this morning. So if you have your Bible available, if you could turn to Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28 these famous words of the Lord Jesus. And Jesus says this, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. I will give you a place of rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find Rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus was inviting people into relationship. 
of grace and truth. Verse 28, Jesus says, come to me, and I will give you this grace-filled and this truthful relationship that you have always wanted and dreamed about. In verse 29, he says, take my yoke upon you. Now, this word yoke, 2,000 years ago, as I've shared with you many times before, had a double meaning. There was a physical meaning of a physical yoke that was used for oxen. It was a piece of wood. But 2,000 years ago, for a Jewish rabbi, and Jesus was either a Jewish rabbi or he was acting as a Jewish rabbi, the word yoke meant teaching. It was the official teaching of a Jewish rabbi. So let's go back to verse 29 and read it using the word teaching. He says, take my teaching upon you and learn from me. See, in the context, that really fits, doesn't it? And learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find, literally what it says, a place of rest for your souls. For my teaching is easy. And that word easy is that it fits well with you and your needs. And my burden is light. He says in verse 29, learn from me. He says, come to me, take my teaching upon me. And then he says, learn from me. Come to me, take my yoke and learn from me. Now Jesus is speaking to three groups of people here. He is speaking to people who have lived in isolation their whole entire lives. And they needed to hear about a relationship that was grace-filled and truthful. They had lived in isolation, no relationship with God, and really no real relationships with the people around them. And then the second group was people living in performance mode, as we talked about last week. They were the religious leaders, and, and, and maybe many of the Jewish people they needed help because they knew they could not live up to the standards in the law of God. And they needed this grace-filled relationship. Think about Nicodemus, one of these individuals. He comes to Jesus at night, and he wants to know more about the teaching of Jesus because it was like something that was really attractive to him because he had been one of the teachers of the law. But he didn't, had never really experienced grace. And then the third category was people living in total excess. I think of Zacchaeus. Remember Zacchaeus? I love this story. We love this story of Zacchaeus. Why? Here's Zacchaeus up in the tree, and Jesus is approaching the city of Jericho. And there's Zacchaeus. And Jesus comes to the tree, and he looks up, and he, first of all, he knows Zacchaeus' name. He's like, Zacchaeus, I want a friendship with you. I'm going to go to your house. I know where you live. But the thing about Jesus and Zacchaeus is that Jesus knew everything about Zacchaeus. He knew he was the chief tax collector. He knew he was the biggest cheat in the whole territory, the whole region. Yet Jesus wanted to go to Zacchaeus' house to be his friend, and to have dinner with him, and even to spend the night. And so for Zacchaeus, it's like, teach me your ways. I need this truthful, real relationship of somebody that actually knows who I am, and in spite of that, still accepts me and loves me. And what happens with Zacchaeus? When he enters into this amazing relationship with Jesus and say, okay, if I have cheated anyone, and he's cheated everybody, I've said that to you before, he says, I'll give back four times everything that I've taken from everybody. See, he's in this type of relationship of grace and truth that we're talking about. And so today we need to take the teaching of Jesus upon ourselves and learn how to walk in this new way of life of living in grace and truth is a perfect mixture and balance of grace and truth. And as I said last week, few Christians and few churches actually find this perfect balance. 
and mixture of grace and truth. So again, I say to you today, let's strive to live in the fullness of grace and truth. Now for the remainder of our time this morning, I want us to consider four questions that, rate, that came out of the sermon last week that people have asked me this week. And they're really great questions. The first one is based on the key verse from last week, John 1.14. So we'll put it on the screen for those that maybe were not able to join us last week. It says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling. He pitched his tent among us, we said. We have seen his glory, the glory of the only one son, who came from the father full or in the fullness of grace and truth. So the first question that was asked of me this week is this. What does it mean that Jesus came from the Father full of grace and truth? Now, we touched on this a little bit last week, but let's kind of expand on this. What does it mean that Jesus came from the Father full of grace and truth? And so we'll put on the screen the answer. Jesus is grace and truth. Jesus is grace and truth. So he came from the Father, God the Father, in the fullness of grace and truth. Why? Because Jesus is grace and truth. God is grace and truth. At the very core of who God is, is grace and truth. Now we know the God of Christianity, we call him the triune God. That he is one person in essence in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and Holy Spirit. But for all of eternity past and for all of eternity future, God, the triune God, lives in perfect relationship of total acceptance and love based in the reality of truth and holiness. That's who God is. And we say, oh, that, that's kind of the definition of what I would like my life to be like. Perfect relationships of total acceptance and love based in the reality of truth and holiness. That somebody would really know who I am, but yet be able to live in holiness. I'm not having all these sin issues and, and, and because so oftentimes, you know, it's like, well, I, I would love to have perfect relationships, but I just mess up all my friendships and I mess up all my relationships and, and but it's like, wow, but God himself, this perfect relationship of total acceptance and love based in the reality of truth and holiness. Now here's the second good question, great question that was asked this week. So, what exactly is grace and truth? What exactly is grace and truth? So we've all been around church long enough that we probably, if we had to, we could come up with some definition of grace and some definition of truth. But I'd like to give to you this morning a new understanding, maybe a new way of looking at grace and truth. So the first question is, what is grace? grace. What is grace? And we're going to put it on the screen. Grace is God's empowering presence, that's the key word, presence, that reaches out to connect with us in the gift of relationship. See, grace is all about relationship. Now, what I wanted to do this morning was to put up on the screen the picture of the painting of Michelangelo. You know, you know the one I'm thinking of where Michelangelo painted God reaching down like this to man, mankind. Now, the reason I couldn't put it on the screen, because this is a family-friendly place, and we're on Facebook Live, who knows who might be watching at what age. But in that picture, Michelangelo paints the man naked. Remember that painting? But grace is when God reaches out to us. That is grace. When he gives to us the gift of relationship. Now remember in that painting, the man's just kind of like, oh, who cares? But God is reaching out to mankind. That is grace. Grace seeks to connect, to be with others in deep and meaningful 
relationships. See, we say, wow, this is what we want, to have relationships that are deep and meaningful in relationships that we go and it's like, I see you, I hear you, I know that you exist, but far more than that, I want to be with you. I want to have a friendship with you. I want to have a relationship with you. But it's even more than that. I am glad to be with you. Right? That, we all want that. I am glad to be with you. See, an acquaintance is like, okay, I, I acknowledge that you exist. And sometimes... You know, even during the pandemic, that was great to be able to go in the store and someone even to acknowledge that you exist. But then to actually have a friendship, a friendship is, I want to be with you. I want to spend time with you. And how we have longed for that in the last 12 to 14 months. But this grace is, I am glad to be with you. I just want to spend time with you, and I'm so glad to be with you. That is grace. Grace is, in the simplest form, as we said last week, is love and acceptance that allows us to grow and heal in our relationships. And we're all broken, and we all need and long for this healing of our souls. Now, we oftentimes think of grace in how I've just kind of described it, in, in kind of evangelism, that in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, it is for, for it is by grace that you are saved. For it is by grace that God has reached out to us to have this relationship. That's evangelism. But grace is also very much about discipleship. So let's put two verses on the screen from Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. For the grace of God, now this might be kind of new, let this kind of sink in. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. Now that's evangelism that we've talked about. But secondly, for the grace of God teaches us, it disciplines us, it transforms us to do two things. First, to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. And I'm going to add some words here, but it, it's there in the text. And to say yes to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Now, how does this work? The grace of God in this relationship with God, in the presence of God, teaches us disciplines us, transforms us as we're in the presence of God to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. When we are in the presence of God, we are transformed to say yes, that we want to live differently, self-controlled lives, because oftentimes our lives are out of control upright lives, godly lives, in this present age. Because oftentimes, maybe we have thought in the past, maybe we think even this morning, that someday when we are in the very presence of God, in the throne room of God, when we go to heaven someday, that is when all of this transformation is going to happen. That it's like, oh, we're not going to want to sin anymore, we're want to go and live completely. No, Paul says to Titus and says to us, that when we are in the presence of God now, in this present age, this is possible. So that when we open this book, now this book, the Holy Scriptures, is not magical. Now it's different than any other book on earth, but it's not magical. But when we open this book and we come into the presence of God, we are transformed. When we take time to pray. Now, sometimes we think some prayer is some kind of magical thing. It's not magical. But as we pray, we come into the very presence of God. And it teaches us, it disciplines us, it transforms us 
to be different people. When we come to a room like this to listen to a sermon, now again, a sermon is not magical. I, I wish it was, it's not. But when we come and listen to a sermon as we're in the Word of God, as we are in prayer, we come into the very presence of God and we are transformed. That is the grace of God. Evangelism and discipleship all together is the grace of God. Now the end result is great joy as we experience the grace of God. Now what about truth? What is truth? Here's what we're going to put on the screen. Truth is living in reality. Now, everybody would agree with that. That's, that is the definition. But we say, well, okay, if that is the definition, why does it seem like so many people around the world today are so crazy? They're, they're almost insane because they're not living in reality. So I want to add these words. Truth is living in reality as God sees it. Not as we wish it to be, not as we hope it to be, not as we conjure in our minds for it to be. That's why there's so much craziness in the world, because everyone's dreaming up their own truth. Truth describes how things really are. Truth describes how things really, really are, from God's point of view. Now that is truth. Truth leads us to what is real to what is accurate about God, ourselves, and others. Truth allows us to see our sinful condition and that we need a Savior, first of all. That we need this relationship of God, of grace, that we've talked about a few moments ago. But, so that's kind of evangelism as we think about grace, about truth. But now about discipleship in regards to truth. Truth allows us, allows us to see other Christians, to see each other as God sees us. Now that's important. And to call us to live out the true identity that we have in Christ. That's why it was about 18 months ago now as we were preaching through the book of Ephesians, right here in this place, week after week after week after week, I would say, from what the book of Ephesians said, is that we are all saints in Christ. And I kept getting pushback from a number of you saying, no, 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 I am not a saint. But what is the truth? See, the truth is, yes, if we are in Christ, then you, we are brand new, and that we are saints in Christ. That's who we are. That is the truth of the Word of God. Now, truth calls people, us as Christians, into God's vision for their lives, proclaiming their life under the reign of Christ and what it really looks like. What does it really look like to be under the reign of King Jesus? What does that look like? What does that look like? like in practical terms. What does it look like in practical terms to be in the kingdom of Christ? What does it look like? That we are all together in the kingdom, each gifted, each shaped exactly how God wants us to be, to work all together in the kingdom. Like I said a couple weeks ago, that let's strive to do the work of the ministry together. See, that's the truth, that we all work together. We're all members of this kingdom of Christ. Now, that is the truth. That is reality. And when we understand this truth of reality, the end result, guess what it is? Joy. Joy when we really understand who we are in Christ and that we're all working together in the kingdom, there is tremendous joy. Not just when we know about it, but when we're actually doing it, there is tremendous joy. So I'd like to read this fairly lengthy statement from Pastor Timothy Keller. 
He's recently retired as a pastor in New York City. He wrote this a number of years ago in his commentary, Peter's Letter to the Galatians. Listen very, very closely as I read these words. He writes, The gospel of justifying faith means that while Christians are in themselves still sinful and sinning, yet in Christ, in God's sight, they are accepted and righteous. So we can say that we are more wicked than we have ever dared believed, but more loved and accepted in Christ than we ever dared hope at the very same time. This creates a radical new dynamic of personal growth. It means that the more you see your own flaws and sins, the more precious and electrifying and amazing God's grace appears to you. But on the other hand, the more aware you are of God's grace and acceptance in Christ, the more able you are to drop your denials and self-defenses and admit the true dimensions and character of your sin. Wow. So that is what we're talking about in living in grace and truth. Now the third question, how do I know I am living in grace and truth? Now that's a great question, because we talked about that, and remember we looked at the four quadrants last week, and how do you know, how do we know, how do, how do you know, how do I know that I'm living in grace and truth? I'm going to give to you a one-word answer, and the one-word answer is joy. Joy. Now, why, why do I say that? So let's put on the screen Romans chapter 14, verse 17, a verse we probably don't talk about very much, you may not even be aware of, because it's kind of in the middle of a big section. But Paul gives to us, the Apostle Paul gives to us the definition of the kingdom of God. And he says this, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. It's not a matter of physical things. But he says of spiritual things. But of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So what is, what is Paul saying here? The kingdom of God is of righteousness, of right living, of peace. Or it can be translated rest that Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 11. And it is all as the result is joy in the Holy Spirit. So we're going to put up on the screen again the grace and truth grid that we introduced to you last week. And I know it's fairly small, but I think it could be helpful. So if you are living in performance, and I said last week that Christians can live in performance where there is truth but no grace. Trying to live right trying to live up to the standards of God in our own strength, but it only destroys peace, rest, and contentment in the process. And there is no joy. So if you're living in that quadrant, you're not going to have any joy. If you're living in total excess, now what does that mean? Grace, but no truth. You're trying to find peace and rest and contentment in your own strength, basically, okay, I need more money, I need more wealth, I need more stuff, and because if I get all this stuff, then I'm going to be happy, I'm going to be content, so forth. In doing that, you destroy right living in the process. So uh, things that, you know, being obedient, you kind of throw that out, and what's the end result? No joy. Your life is miserable even though you're trying to go and do that. Now, if you're living in growth, this quadrant of growth or grace and truth, when you experience right living and peace and rest and contentment together based in grace and truth, and the end result will be joy in the Holy Spirit. Do you get that? So if we're trying to go in our own strength to live up to the standards of God, to all the laws of God, there's not going to be any joy. If you're like, well, okay, I'm just saved. I'm just going to appreciate all my grace. I'm going to God's grace. I'm going to go to heaven someday, but I'm just going to live here now any way I want, and I'm going to find my own peace and rest and contentment, 
and you go and you live a very sinful life, there's not going to be any joy. But it's only when you come under grace and truth where you actually live right in righteousness and also you find the peace and rest and contentment that your soul has always been looking for. Those things have to be together and the end result will be tremendous joy. And so how do you know if you're living in grace and truth? Do you have this tremendous joy and it's just, is it building more and more as you go on? And if you're not experiencing that joy, then you may not be truly in grace and truth as much as you would think. Now the fourth and final question, and this is also a great question, how long will it take to experience this growth? Now this all sounds great, but how long is it gonna take and how long will this process be? So we're gonna put one final thing on the screen here. And this comes from Campus Crusade, they've been using this for years for crew, and it's great. It says, grace plus truth over time equals growth. Here's the takeaway. Grace plus truth over time equals growth. Now let me say it this way, and you might want to write down part of this too. In the big picture of growing relationally, we need grace, we need truth, we need time, all in the context of relationships all in the context of relationships. It's all about relationships. We said that a few weeks ago. So let me describe it this way. An atmosphere of grace, we spend time in the presence of other people, because we said grace is all about presence. So we spend time in the presence of other people where, mis where mistakes and errors are forgiven, because we're not perfect, and you don't have to earn love and acceptance. The environment of truth, where the Bible is read and studied and spoken to challenge, encourage, and correct. There is no fear of truth when you're surrounded and affirmed by grace. Because as you go and read and study the Bible and the, and, and the word of God is spoken to you, it's going to be like, it's like, yeah. As Pastor Keller said, it's like, okay. My sin is worse than I ever imagined. But when you're around a group of people that are affirming you and supporting you and encouraging you, and it's like, yep, my issues may be different than your issues, but I also have issues surrounded and affirmed by grace. An element of time where you know that someone is with you over the long haul. That's so important. It's not just, well, you know, they, they like me, they're encouraging me for a couple of days or a couple of weeks, but then all my friends and all my relationships, I just kind of wander off, and it's like, well, yeah, see, they didn't really want to be with me anyway. But let me read that again. Where you know that someone is with you over the long haul. Growth is not instantaneous, but it happens over time. And probably we could say over a lifetime. And then finally, the context of relationships. Growth happens when we're free to be ourselves. It is not what we all want to be. We just want to be ourselves. All of our shortcomings, we don't have to go and hide all those. It's like, yeah, I'm not perfect. And I still have shortcomings. And sometimes I'm still dealing with sin issues. And, and here I am. In a small group or a group of supporting people. Then there is freedom to experience real brokenness and healing. Because we're all broken. We all are. Because people are sinful. People are sinners. And people around us, in their sinful acts, or maybe their sinful words, have broken us. But in our sinful acts, in our sinful words, we have broken other people around us. And we need to ask them for forgiveness and we need to have that healing process. And oftentimes with our sinful acts and our sinful words and our sinful thoughts, we have damaged ourselves that we're broken. See, it's all by, by sin. Sin has broken us. 
And we all need, we all need to experience healing. And this healing only comes by grace and truth. Grace and truth. So in practical terms, what do we need to do? How do we strive to live in the fullness of grace and truth? So we need to encourage one another. We need to encourage one another as we experience grace and truth together. So what does it look like to truly encourage others? I'm going to go back to my opening statement. Helping people, helping people experience love, acceptance, and healing based in the reality of brokenness and that we're sinners. Helping people experience hope and growth and joy that is produced in our lives as we live in the fullness of grace and truth that is only found in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not found anywhere else except for Jesus Christ. And so he invites us into our relationship. Come to me. Come and experience grace and truth. Come and experience grace. I want a relationship with you. But I also want to transform you so that you can have the deepest and meaningful relationships with the people around us, around you. I'm going to transform you and change you so you don't have to go and live in the same patterns that you've lived in the past of hurting people, saying things against people, gossiping against people, acting in sinful ways against people so that you can actually have those true, deep and meaningful relationships that you've always dreamed of. What I'm describing to you is the gospel. This is the gospel. We talk about the gospel sometimes as a bunch of teachings on a piece of paper, or maybe even found in the Bible. But this is the gospel, that we are all broken. That's the truth. We all need healing, and it's available to us that we can have this relationship with God through his grace. We can be changed and transformed so we can have real relationships with the people around us. That is the gospel. That's the gospel, the message, the message of the gospel. But we are also to live out the message of the gospel. We can live it out. That's what church is all about. That's what the local church is all about, to live out the gospel of this fullness of grace and truth. Because we know we're broken. I know that I'm broken. And more and more I'm realizing that you're all broken. And we need to realize more and more that everybody outside the walls of this building are broken. And they all need this healing that only comes through Christ in grace and truth. So let's say it again one last time. Let's strive to live in the fullness of grace and truth. Let's say it again. Let's strive to live in the fullness of grace and truth. Worship team. I'll invite you guys to stand and sing this last song with us this morning. This last song taken, much of it taken from the book of Revelation.
Thank you, worship team. I'm going to ask Kirsten if you would come and give us an announcement right now about need for more people in the worship team. Alrighty. So, I know you guys all love hearing my lovely voice every single week and all the time, but I would really love to add some more people to the mix. So, um, the worship team rehearses on Thursday evenings at 7 o'clock right here in this room. Um, and we have a need for anybody that loves music, that loves singing, that has a talent, has a gift that they would like to share. Um, it would not have to be an every week basis if we had more people. Um, Paul and Allie and Vinyl and John have been so faithful um, for so long to be here every single week. Um, and I just, I would really love to see the load shared. I would really love to see other people that I know are here that are musically gifted that 
can offer something to share with the rest of the congregation, with the rest of your brothers and sisters here in this room who would um, be blessed to see some new faces and new people. Um, it's, it's low maintenance. We try and keep rehearsals um, pretty short. I send out a list of what we're singing. There's plenty of advance notice of what we're gonna be doing. I try and get about a month out with songs. So even if you're, you can't commit to every week and maybe you can only commit to once a month, I will have a set list for you that should be pretty well set. Um, so that you can join us on that week and having gotten the song in your ear, know how to help and join in and lend your musical gifts. So if you're musically gifted, if you're musically talented, um, and you have a heart to lead people in worship, then I'd love to see you on a Thursday night at seven o'clock. Um, I think my phone number is pretty readily available, but if it's not, um, I'll make sure that we have it out there, but it, um, I'd give it to you now, but it'd be awkward, so I'm not going to. So um, it's readily available. We'll get it to you somehow. Give me a call. Send me a text so that I know to look for you and, and be thinking of you and have something set up for you to be able to join us on a Thursday evening. We'd love to see you guys. Okay, thank you very much. Let's see. This coming Saturday is another men's breakfast. We're going to be meeting at Governor's again at 7 a.m., 7 to just a little after 8. Uh, Bill Johnson is going to be the speaker, correct, Doug? If you would like to sign up, Zeb, look for Zeb. He's going to have the official sign-up sheet after the service this morning. This coming Saturday, we're also having a church work day from 8.30 to 11. 8.30 to 11, we have a lot of cleaning projects. We have maintenance projects throughout the building, and we really haven't had one for over a year, so uh, we're going to be uh, cleaning the church kitchen and by that point, it's going to be basically officially done, hopefully by next Saturday. And so that needs to be cleaned and put back together. Now today, after this service, we're having a special business meeting. So we have four items with a special business meeting. We can only do whatever's on the item. So that's going to be just in a few moments. We'll take a short break. One of the things that we are, whoops, we're going to be covering is uh, making some renovations to this room, uh, painting the walls. Uh, new carpeting. So this will be the color scheme. So we will be talking about all that. So if you are an official church member, we would invite you to stay after the service. And uh, we have four fairly quick items. And uh, so that will be happening right after the service. So let's stand and we will close our service in prayer. For those on Facebook Live, thank you for joining us today. And uh, we hope to be able to see you in person soon or that you can join us again next week. Let's close in prayer.